Um, so I, uh, you might have seen the headline or the title of the stream. Today is, uh, or rather, today would be Freddie Gray's 32nd birthday. So um, I kind of wanted to talk that, about that a little bit. For those of you who don't know who Freddie Gray is, who haven't heard that name before, um, a few years before George Floyd, we had Freddie Gray in the year 2015 who was killed in police custody. Um, and uh, subsequently, there was a mass uprising in the streets of Baltimore City. Um, There's a lot of property damage, a lot of arrests made, the police abused lots of uh, children, teenagers. There was a lot of really ugly stuff that happened in the days that followed um, Freddie Gray's death, as well as the mistrial of the police officers who were involved. So let me go ahead. There's this uh, this Vox piece here that's from 2016. I'm wondering if it's been updated. No, I guess not. All right, so here we go. I'll just read it. Baltimore was roiled by weeks of tense protests after the April 19 death of Freddie Gray, a 25-year-old black man who died of a spinal cord injury while in police custody. But the justice system ultimately punished no one for it. The Baltimore protests erupted after Freddie Gray's mysterious death. And it wasn't mysterious. We all know what happened to Freddie Gray. We don't know the gory details, but we know the police killed Freddie Gray. Gray's death and the protests it inspired once again placed a national spotlight on issues of race, justice, police brutality, and the deep distrust between minority communities and their local governments. The protests came about almost immediately following Gray's death as demonstrators marched to demand answers for what happened to the 25-year-old and to protest police brutality, of which Baltimore has a troubling history. We'll take a look at that later because I want to get into that. The situation escalated as local authorities refused to release details in their investigation into Gray's death. Riots broke out on April 27th after Gray's funeral, drawing nationwide attention and even comments from President Barack Obama over the crumbling situation in the city. But on May 1st, Baltimore City State's attorney Marilyn Mosby, who fucking sucks, free Keith Davis Jr., Uh, Marilyn Mosby announced criminal charges, including second-degree murder and manslaughter, against the six officers involved in Gray's arrest. The announcement calmed tensions in the city as protesters felt that one of their main goals had been reached. But ultimately, surprise, surprise, none of the charges stuck. Much of the anger during protests was focused on the lack of answers surrounding Gray's death, which persisted for weeks. As the investigation dragged on, many people felt that the local government and police were engaging in a cover-up to hide how Gray received the spinal cord injury that killed him and whether the officers that arrested him caused it. But the protests and riots in Baltimore are also part of a much broader national debate about systemic problems that have existed for decades. The protests are specifically about one man in a very troubled neighborhood that gets a disproportionate amount of attention from police, but they also seek to bring attention to the police brutality that all too often afflicts black men in the U.S. Freddie Gray suffered a fatal spinal cord injury on April 12th when he was tossed around the back of a police van. He was shackled by his hands and feet, but unrestrained by his seatbelt, which meant he couldn't protect himself from the impact as he crashed into the interior of the vehicle. An autopsy report, which was obtained by the Baltimore Sun's Justin Fenton, found Gray likely received the energy when the van suddenly decelerated. He died a week later, on April 19th. On May 1st, Baltimore City State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby announced that the death had been ruled a homicide by a medical examiner. Mosby announced 28 criminal charges, including second-degree murder and manslaughter, against the six officers involved in Gray's arrest. A grand jury on May 21st indicted all six officers for Gray's death, but none of the charges stuck in court. Gray was arrested for allegedly possessing a switchblade, which is for anyone who doesn't understand uh, city versus county in terms of like jurisdictions and legalities for police departments, 
Um, the inner cities, you literally cannot even cross the street without breaking the law somehow, without giving the police a reason to stop and harass you and potentially arrest you, right? It's kind of like stop and frisk, except um, it's legal because on the books, um, the police can say you were breaking uh, jaywalking law or in this case, you had a spring assisted knife, which is for to understand how silly this is, is a knife that you could drive 15 minutes out of the city and buy in a box store like Dick Sporting Goods, Walmart, anything like that. But as soon as you cross that that city line in the city with that knife, congratulations, you are now breaking the law. And the police now have uh, the carte blanche to do whatever they want to you as if they didn't already have that. But legally on paper, um, it gives people who are bystanders to the event an excuse to look the other way on it, which is what the fascistic raving lunatic hog right wingers would do anyway because they understand better than anyone that the role of police is not to protect you or to protect the public the role of the police is to enforce hegemony and to enforce class division right and to protect property but the neoliberals and the liberals are whatever for whatever reason still under the impression that the police serve the public good in terms of, you know, protecting the populace, even though there's a crazy amount of unsolved rapes, crazy amount of unsolved murders, the police themselves rape and murder people, um, the police sell drugs, all, all this stuff that I could go on and on about, but I'm sure you, you understand my point. Gray was arrested for allegedly possessing a switchblade, but Mosby said Gray's knife wasn't a switchblade and was therefore illegal. Which is a completely moot point anyway. Like I said earlier, even if it was a spring-assisted knife, the fact that you could buy that same exact knife 15 minutes away in the county and then bring it into the city and it instantly becomes illegal is absurdly silly and obvious, very, very obvious what the point of that is, but... According to a timeline provided by Mosby, Gray fled at the site of police presence in an area of town known for drug dealing. Police pursued Gray, eventually catching up and restraining him on the ground. Officers then arrested Gray after they noticed a knife on him. Video footage of the arrest showed officers dragging Gray, who was screaming in apparent pain, to a police van. Police don't use force in the video, but the recording started after the officers already had Gray in custody. One of the people who recorded the arrest, Kevin Moore, described the scene to the Baltimore Sun's Catherine Rents, claiming that police folded Gray like origami, contradicting claims that officers peacefully restrained him. The officer had their knee in his neck and he was just screaming, screaming for life, Moore said. He couldn't breathe, he needed an asthma pump, which he let them know, and they ignored it. And as we all know now, based on what happened to George Floyd, this is incredibly plausible because... That is what the police do. They don't care. They don't care that you have a medical condition. They don't care about any of that. They're going to do what they want to do. And what they want to do is kneel on your back or kneel on your neck or and uh, any other form or fashion hurt you, injure you um, to the point that you are dead or almost dead. And then they could just kill you later. Police transported Gray to the station in a van in which he reportedly experienced a medical emergency as a result of his neck injury and was eventually transferred to trauma care. Gray wasn't wearing a seatbelt while riding in the van, Baltimore Police Commissioner Anthony Batts revealed in a press conference on April 24th. No excuses for that, period, he said. And that right there, um, for anyone who, if, if you're lucky enough to have never countered, never had any encounters with the law or law enforcement, it's bullshit and it's PR. And there actually is an excuse for that. And the excuse for that is that there are no seatbelts in the back of those vans. At several points, Gray pleaded for medical care, including an inhaler for his asthma, but police ignored him. One of the officers thought Gray was faking his injury, according to the Baltimore Sun's Justin George. But Bat said in an April 20th press conference that there were multiple occasions when police should have called medics but didn't, and those failures have prompted a review of police policies to ensure detainees get medical care when they need it. 
which is just more PR. Like I said, they don't give a fuck. They don't care. If they cared about you needing medical attention, they probably wouldn't kneel on your neck and back in the first place. You know what I mean? But I digress. And yes, Geninator, yeah, absolutely, 100% PR. The police van reportedly stopped at least four times before Gray was sent to trauma care, once to place leg shackles on Gray, and later to pick up another detainee who was separated from Gray by a metal barrier in the back of the van. And that's what I'm talking about. So, first of all, um, it's very sus that they stopped just to put leg shackles on him because they either should have, one, put the leg shackles on him when they first put him in the van, or number two, waited till they got to central bookings to then put the leg irons on him. Because the that has been my experience, and that was only the first time I got arrested, was that um, obviously I was in handcuffs, but in order to prevent you from like... Which is also silly, might I add, because by this point, you're already in a fenced off barbed wire area about to be taken into uh, like super high security facility, facility, right? And you're already handcuffed, but just to add the extra insult to injury and to really, really make sure you aren't going to try to escape or anything, they put you in leg irons that uh, just like tear up your ankles um, if they're being dickheads, they'll tighten them up. They'll t- they already tighten your handcuffs. That's something that police already do. But if they really want to be dicks, they'll tighten up your leg irons and you'll, by the time you get out, you'll have little cuts and stuff all over your ankles. And as for the van, there is a metal barrier in the center of the van, right? So if you can imagine like, um, like, I don't know if you guys have ever taken, like, a transportation, like, from school, if the, if you went to a private school or something, and they had, like, a van transportation service instead of a, a bus. In this van, which is, like, a box econo van, down the center is a, like, metal partition. So, once you're inside of the van, you can't really sit, like, how I'm sitting in this chair right now while you're handcuffed. You have to kind of... A tilt like you're you're kind of cocked to the side because you just don't have enough room to put your knees and legs out and as i said before there's no seat belts back there right even if there were were seat belts back there the, pol- the police would have to put them on you because clearly you are handcuffed right it's just it it's silly <clears throat> Combined, the details exposed by Mosby investigations suggest that Gray shouldn't have been arrested, which is, I mean, that's true of like 80% of the people who get arrested in the city. And the officers involved in Gray's arrest were at best negligent and at worst abusive. So I said this on stream before. You never assume malice where ignorance will suffice, but... That said, sometimes there is ignorance that is so advanced that it's indistinguishable from malice. And if you don't understand what I mean by that, it's that your level of carelessness and callousness is so far gone that you have to legitimately hate and actively dislike anyone who might encounter you, you might give this treatment to, right? So, um, even if what I'm talking about and what they did was just protocol. It was something that was dictated to them to do in order for you to carry out that action and just do your job. You have to hate the people that you're doing it to, because there's no way you would be able to do that to someone that you even cared about, gave the the smallest, most minuscule amount of respect, the same as any stranger you would on the street. Right? So as police released few answers for weeks regarding Freddie Gray's death, tensions boiled over at times into heated protests and riots. On April 25th, after hours of large, peaceful demonstrations, some protesters began smashing car and business windows and looting stores. At one point, police briefly closed off the Cannon Yards baseball stadium, keeping people at the Baltimore Orioles and Boston Red Sox game stuck inside until police gave the all clear, which was, if you were here and you remember that, was a wild event. I'm not sure. Um, A lot of people in my chat are not from or didn't live in or around Baltimore, but 
it was a crazy period of time. Um, of course, all the white tourists were just pissed because they couldn't go get beers or hit the bars after their baseball games or whatever. It was silly. And naturally, just like with some of the footage um, where you saw when I was at the George Floyd protests last summer, where one of the cars drove by, drove through the crowd and yelled out the window, fucking N words. I don't want to repeat what he said. Um, it's, it's one of the clips in my, in my stream. You can actually find it now if you go look at my clips, but, um, just like, uh, that situation naturally during this, there were white tourists from the baseball game antagonizing protesters, starting fights, uh, screaming racial slurs, so on and so forth. Um, violence broke out on April 27th when demonstrators looted, burned 144 vehicles and 15 buildings, and threw bricks, bottles, and other objects at police, injuring at least 20 officers. And that's inaccurate. Well, I mean, it's accurate that happened, but I don't think that this article is going to go into the reasons why that happened. And I don't just mean their reaction to Freddie Gray's murder. I mean that the police literally created a funnel by which the the children getting out of school were forced into that situation. And let, let me see. Hold on, let me see if I can find something else that. Um, hang on. Like, there was a fake, um, there was a fake, uh, like, not meme, but like a fake, like, poster, like, fake flyer that was going around that no one knew where it originated from. It more than likely originated from the police, but there was a fake flyer that was going around saying, like, you know, we're going to riot, we're going to destroy all the stuff, da 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 which um, obviously the children involved in this uprising had not created, but the police had created and put out either to instigate the children to do that or in the event that the children ended up not doing it, they would have an excuse to go forth and arrest all these children and say, look, they were planning on uh, doing all this crazy stuff. Um, but uh, this is The Guardian. Maybe hold on, I'll, I'll show you guys this just because. So, uh, 49 children were arrested and detained during those protests. Um, so during the three days following Freddie Gray's funeral, almost 50 children were held despite 39 of them meeting standards for release, a public defender's office says. Let me see. In one stark example, an elementary school fifth grader was arrested in an incident described by the public defender's office as protest related. He received a low JDAI score and was recommended for release, but instead was kept in juvenile jail for a night. In a statement, the OPD continued, the young boy was then brought to court in chains, hands and feet shackled before finally being released to his parents. This is a fifth grader. This is a fifth grader. This is someone that's like 11 or 12 years old. In chains, shackled, feet shackled, hands and feet. This is what the police do. This is the, the, the whole reason that they exist. Um, this doesn't really explain. I, and like, I'm trying really hard to, so I can explain. Um, okay, here we go. I think this is, okay, here we go. This is from Mother Jones. Here we go. Okay, yes, this is actually going to explain what happened. The Baltimore riots didn't start the way you think. Baltimore teachers and parents tell a different story from the one you've been reading in the media. After Baltimore police and a crowd of teens clashed near the Mondawmin Mall in northwest Baltimore on Monday afternoon, news reports described the violence as a riot triggered by kids who had been itching for a fight all day. But in interviews with Mother Jones and other media outlets, teachers and parents maintained that police actions inflamed a tense but stable situation. So, um, the one detail that I do remember very distinctly that I could tell you guys was that Mondawmin Mall, this is, so Mondawmin Mall is where it all got sparked off. People who don't know, um, Mondawmin Mall 
has uh, a metro station and a bus station. And city schools, if you go to a city school, there is no like yellow bus system like a lot of you in nicer like county areas and you would expect at a nicer school. If you go to a city school, you're taking public transportation. You're taking the actual MTA bus or you're taking the train. What they ended up doing is stopping all service to those transportation forms. So during that day, like I was saying, the day that the, this flyer said that the children were going to, you know, cause all this destruction that we know was false, that the police made up on that same day, the police had stopped service for the bus and stopped service for the train in that stop. So what you had was all these kids from the school in that area who were literally trapped and like three miles from where they lived, right? <clears throat> the funeral of Freddie Gray, a 25-year-old black man who died in police custody this month, had ended hours earlier at a nearby church. According to the Baltimore Sun, a call to purge, yes, it was is a call to purge, a reference to the 2013 dystopian film in which all crime is made legal for one night circulated on social media among school-age Baltimoreans that morning. The rumored plan, which was not traced to any specific person or group, that means the police made it, was to assemble at the Mondawmin Mall at 3 p.m. and proceed down Pennsylvania Avenue toward downtown Baltimore. The Baltimore Police Department, which was aware of the purge call, prepared for the worst. Shortly before noon, the department issued a statement saying it had received credible information that members of various gangs have entered into a partnership to take out law enforcement officers. So, like I was saying, these kids were literally trapped in this area because there was no transportation in or out of this area. So they got out of school and had nowhere to go except down Pennsylvania Avenue, which coincidentally is the same route that was described as they were going to take during this purge call, which we know was not created by any of these kids. It was created by the police. And on top of that, you have the police saying, yeah, we have credible information that some gangs are going to try to, to take us out. Mind you, we have no idea where this credible information came from, but the police said it, so it must be true, right? When school let out that afternoon, police were in the area equipped with full riot gear. According to eyewitnesses in the Mondama neighborhood, the police were stopping buses and forcing rioters, including many students who were trying to get home, to disembark. Cops shut down the local subway stop. They also blockaded roads near the Mondawmin Mall and Frederick Douglass High School, which is across the street from the mall, and essentially corralled young people in the area. That is, they did not allow the after-school crowd to disperse. So, typically, when you have a riot or something happen, what do the police say? Disperse. Please disperse. However, in this situation, you have the police that have set them up in this situation to... They were pre-kettled. If you don't know what kettling is, kettling is when the police trap you in the area in order to come in and make mass arrests, right? The police had already preemptively done this. And we're talking, mind you, we're talking about high school kids. Sometimes we're talking, and some kids were middle school kids. Like I said earlier, there was a kid in fifth grade who was arrested during this. Megan Harris, a teacher at a nearby school, described on Facebook what happened. Police were forcing buses to stop and unload all their passengers. Then, Frederick Douglass High School students in huge herds were trying to leave on various buses, but couldn't catch any because they were all shut down. No kids were yet around except about 20 who looked like they were waiting for police to do something. The cops, on the other hand, were in full riot gear, marching toward any small social clique of students. It looked as if there were hundreds of cops. The kids were standing around in groups of three or four, Harris said in a Facebook message to Mother Jones. They weren't doing anything. No rock throwing, nothing. The cops started marching towards a group of kids who were just milling about. A teacher at Douglas High School who asked not to be identified tells a similar story. When school was winding down, many students were leaving early with their parents or of their own accord. Those who didn't depart early, she says, were stranded. Many of the students still at school at that point, she notes, wanted to get out of the area and avoid any purge-like violence. Some were requesting rides home from teachers, but by now it was difficult to leave the neighborhood. 
I rode with another teacher home, this teacher recalls, and we had to route our travel around the police in riot gear blocking the road. The majority of my students thought what was going to happen was stupid or were frightened at the idea. Very few seem to want to participate in the purge. <coughs> yeah, exactly, Jenna. It's because the, the point is not to create peace. The point is to arrest everyone. A parent who picked up his children from a nearby elementary school says via Twitter, the kids stood across from the police and looked like they were asking them, why can't we get on the buses? But the police were just gazing. Majority of those kids aren't from around that neighborhood. They need those buses and trains in order to get home. He continued, if they would have let them children go home, yesterday wouldn't have even turned out like that. Meg Gibson, another Baltimore teacher, described a similar scene to Gawker. The riot police were already at the bus stop on the other side of the mall, turning buses that transport the students away, not allowing students to board. They were waiting for the kids. Those kids were set up. They were treated like criminals before the first brick was even thrown. With police unloading buses and with the nearby metro station shut down, there were few ways for students to clear out. Several eyewitnesses in the area that afternoon say that police seemed to arrive at Mondalman anticipating mobs and violence prior to any looting. At 3.01 p.m., the Baltimore Police Department posted on its Facebook page, There is a group of juveniles in the area of Mondalman Mall. Expect traffic delays in the area. But many of the kids, according to eyewitnesses, were stuck there because of police actions. The Baltimore Police Department did not respond to requests for comment because, of course, they wouldn't. Around 3.30, the police reported that juveniles had begun to throw bottles and bricks. Fifteen minutes later, the police department noted that one of its officers had been injured. After that, the violence escalated and rioters started looting the Mondaman Mall and Baltimore was in for a long night of trouble and violence. But as the event is reviewed and investigated, an important question warrants attention. What might have happened had the police not prevented students from leaving the area? The department's own actions increased the chances of conflict. And... The answer to that question is absolutely fucking lutely yes, right? There was even videos that were floating around of the police throwing the bricks and the bottles first and the kids throwing them back, right? And if you know anything about things like bait bricks, you know perfectly well that it's completely plausible. And that's what I saw happen. Um, let me show you a thing about uh, bait bricks. The, it's, I can't even show you because all these shits are about whether or not bait bricks are real and bait bricks are ac absolutely real. Um, so what I'll, I'll just explain to you. So what bait bricks are, are um, what the police will do is they will leave out random piles of bricks or they will go through the facade if the facade has like loose stones or bricks or anything and put them out like on the sidewalk so that the temptation is there for protesters and so on and so forth to pick up that brick and throw it at a window or whatever and then um give the police you know give the police the uh go ahead to then go through and arrest everyone and make mass arrests pepper spray people or whatever essentially it's an excuse for police to escalate whatever level of violence that they are currently engaging in. So, um, yeah, that was uh, the whole situation with the 2015 uprising with Freddie Gray. Rest in peace, Freddie Gray. He would have been 30, 32 today. He's, you know, only, only nine days older than me. Um, my birthday is the 25th. I will be turning 32. And yeah, man, it's, it could have just as easily happened to me, just as easily happened to me. My encounter with the police, well, one of my encounters with the police, I got guns pointed in my face. Three officers with, with Glocks pointed directly in my face, right in my apartment over something that, that isn't even illegal in the state anymore, right? Over something that a lot of white people in, in the state are making a lot of money off of and in other areas, right? I'm talking about cannabis, talking about uh, marijuana. Um, so, yeah, man, rest in peace, Freddie Gray. Abolish the police. The Baltimore Police Department is a criminal organization. Um, 
just yeah that's that's the vibe that's the vibe so 